Welcome to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Street Ventures, where we talk to top experts and seasoned investors to help provide clarity and key insights to keep you safe on your journey to financial freedom. Our goal is to help you get educated on how to create passive income for you and your family using real estate as your vehicle. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and a written review to help us grow and reach more listeners. Hey everyone, I'm excited to introduce you to our newest host that we're bringing on to the podcast team. His name is Peter Pomeroy. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Peter over the last year and his growth in this space has been tremendous. He comes from a background in commercial real estate and I know you're going to enjoy all the value he's going to bring to the show. He is now an owner operator himself in the multifamily space. So welcome Peter Pomeroy. Hello everyone. Welcome back to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast. My name is Peter Pomeroy and I am your host. Today we have David Robinson with us. David is CEO and founder of Canovo Capital, a boutique real estate investment firm located in Salt Lake City. He is an active investor, broker, and is the podcast host of the Lead Sponsor Podcast. As a broker and investor, David has been directly involved in over $350 million in real estate transactions at Canovo Capital. David oversees all due diligence, capital raising, investor relations, and asset management for his firm. David, welcome to the show. Peter, it's a privilege to be on your show and looking forward to our conversation. Terrific. So as usual, let's just get into it. Let's do so, it. Yeah. So why don't, so, so maybe like, I, I'd like, I think it would be helpful um, to kind of frame up our, our overall conversation. If you shared with our listeners, kind of this, your, your story of what, um, of, you know, how you've gotten to be, you know, to where you are, um, you know, what, was there a certain motivation to focus on apartments and, and just share that with our listeners? Yeah. So my background, I, I've been in the real estate world for roughly 18 years. Uh, my background is in the residential brokerage space. And so um, the first rough, roughly decade of my career, uh, I focused on, um, you know, your traditional residential uh, uh, brokerage business and, and real estate agent business. Um, early on, I was focused uh, almost exclusively on foreclosure prevention and short sales. And so uh, uh, through the run up in into 2008 and on the back end of 2008 for a couple of years, that was almost all we did. Uh, built one of the largest uh, short sale and foreclosure businesses here in Utah. And then as the market started to shift, I, I made a shift myself and uh, started a, a traditional residential sales team. And that's where I spent most of my time was on the management, uh, the team building side, the management side of, of re uh, residential sales, and then managing a national franchise brokerage as well. Um, about, uh, you know, after a decade of being in the business, I looked back and realized I had done, uh, I hadn't done enough as related to my own personal investing. Uh, I hadn't built up any significant amount of cash flow, uh, or wealth in my life, which is unfortunate. Um, but it's not uncommon for real estate brokers to fall into that trap of doing business but not investing yourself. And it's tragic almost because you're on the front lines of real estate investing, but you'd be surprised at how many uh, real estate agents and brokers actually don't invest themselves. And I fell into that trap. And I realized after sort of a traumatic life event where I almost lost my dad, um, and, and it caused me to really evaluate where I was financially and what would happen to my family at that point in time if I had something horrible happen. And that caused me to start to rethink my business model, the direction I was headed. Ultimately, what it caused me to do is to uh, depart from the residential, the traditional residential business and started my own boutique uh, uh, investment firm, uh, brokerage and investment firm that was focused on small scale multifamily property here in Utah. And so today we still uh, run that business and we focus on serving clients that are looking to buy, again, small scale, referring to anything under 
roughly $5 million all the way down to your typical fourplex uh, multifamily business. And we help clients buy and sell that product type all up and down the Wasatch Front here in Utah. In addition to that, a couple of years uh, uh, ago, I had a lot of my investors that were seeking um, ways to diversify and achieve better cash on cash returns than what we were able to produce here in Utah. And it caused me to really start to explore alternatives for my investors. And that's when I was exposed to the real estate syndication model and started uh, acquiring with my partners larger commercial multifamily assets, structuring those as syndications which would allow members of our investor network to participate alongside us in those type of opportunities. So that's uh, the synopsis. I'll, I'll sort of leave it there and let you let you take it from there. That, that, that's great. And um, I, I also understand the, uh, you know, I was a broker, a commercial broker, Collier's. And, um, and it was kind of amazing that I, that I did as little investing in real estate as, um, as I did. Um, and you just get in this trap of being focused on transactions and transactions and all of a sudden time goes by. And uh, then I had to, you know, like like you, but in a different different way, make a concerted effort to get into investing. Um, so um, shifting to to your model. So you're doing a combination of brokerage and syndication. Are you when you're when you're buying properties to syndicate? Are those properties in the same markets where your um, your transaction clients are buying and selling their you know ten unit properties, or are you in a different market? So how do you like where I'm going? Is is how do you avoid like a, a, a potentially perceived conflict of interest? Yeah, great question. So we've been pretty intentional about avoiding buying anything in our local market, especially in that smaller scale multifamily category. Mm -hmm. So anything under $5 million, we generally avoid uh, trying to purchase unless we're doing some sort of joint venture with one of our clients, right? Right. And, and so we, we try to avoid that conflict of interest. Although I think there's ways to navigate that without having any conflict of interest. Um, it's just a personal decision that we made to try to stay out of that space and really focus on serving the clients in that space and then providing them opportunities to get involved in larger commercial deals uh, through the syndication model. What was it like um, educating, informing um, your clients that you know, you and your firm do more than just brokerage transactions that we have this other arm. Was that, I mean, for me, it seems like a no brainer, easy to understand, but I'm also, I've been in real estate for 20 years. Were there challenges or obstacles that you had to overcome or, or not so much? You know, it came by fairly organically. Um, we were building, you know, we had built up a fairly large investor network and uh, time and time again, as I would get on calls with the investors, um, strategy calls where we would sort of explore what they were trying to accomplish and what their goals were, um, it, it was time and time again that I would have a conversation with a, uh, an investor or a would-be investor who, after our call, realized, I actually don't want to own that 12-plex, <laughs> that 24-plex, right. that 8-plex, that 4-plex, right? right? Um, I want all the benefits that real estate can provide, but I don't necessarily want to own that thing. Right. And and so once we started, uh, I, I realized I had a large percentage of my investor network that fell into that category. Um, not all of them. Obviously, sure. many of my investors love owning their own assets and building their own small, small portfolio. And they love being hands-on, but many of them didn't. And so that's when I started to really explore what were some alternatives to help them participate in real estate investing without actually having to deal with the headaches and hassles and challenges of personal ownership and management? Um, and then from there, it, it it started getting the wheels spinning. And I realized uh, that's when I was exposed to the syndication model. Even being in the real estate business, uh, you know, uh, primarily on the residential side, I hadn't been exposed to the syndication model. I wasn't very familiar with it. And so I really dove in and learned all that I could about it. Um, and then I went to my investors and I said, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Would you be interested in participating in this type of deal? There was two things I was trying to accomplish. Number one, I wanted to help those investors that didn't want to necessarily be active investors. Um, number two, I had a, another segment of my investor network 
They were pushing me to provide them with better opportunities that could produce a better cash on cash return, better than what I was able to produce here in Utah. Right. Because a high growth market, there's a lot of reasons to be investing in Utah, but cash flow isn't necessarily one of those at this point in time. And so it was really hard to come by. So I had more and more investors saying, hey, you know, we would love to see better cash flow. And I said, well, we're probably going to have to go outside of Utah to actually get you better cash flow. Uh, and so that was number two. And uh, number three is a lot of my investors wanted to diversify outside of Utah. Even if they were interested in being both active and passive, they wanted to maybe have some of their eggs in a different basket and uh, and get outside of Utah a little bit. And so as a byproduct of those conversations with my investors, I sought out to, to figure out a, a pathway to help them participate in that. And that's where the syndication model came into play. And it's worked wonderfully for my investors because their response was when I sent out some messaging to them saying, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. I, I, I'm looking at participating or finding opportunity in uh, a few select Midwest markets that could produce a better um, cash on cash return than what you're likely to find here. This is how they would be structured. It would be commercial grade real estate. You could invest passively in them. We would own and operate the deal uh, from the management side. And and uh, this is how that would work. And and the response was very, very positive. So I knew I was onto something. And that's when we got you know into our first deal, uh, a 164 unit C-class value add deal in Kansas City, Missouri. So I think that um, you know what's so kind of brilliant about you know your model that you've just described is that you're sat you're you're satisfying you're meeting a need um, a very specific need and um, yes you have these these clients who want who you're serving on the transaction side in Salt Lake and. Um, you know, you you realize that well, maybe they would like to invest somewhere else for for different reasons, diversification, cash on cash. Um, you know, they don't want to deal with the headaches of self self managing uh, the properties, and um, and it, so it's really exciting to hear what hear what you're saying. Let's so let's shift over, um, and and we will in a moment. Um, we'll 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 hit on. Um, kind of the, the, you know, some some of the outcomes of this in what I kind of in my head view, just as a heads up, is your 48 hour raise. Um, So we'll get to that in a second. But um, so let's shift over to markets, property type, you know, pretty quickly. So what markets are you in? Um, You know, and then are you focused on C properties, B properties, just kind of quickly so we have some context? Yeah. So on the syndication side, um, yes we are looking to be highly diversified. So one of the main pieces of value that I bring to my investor network is enabling them to do, to diversify significantly across their uh, portfolio. So for me, I believe my job is to provide them with a variety of opportunities. And when I'm talking about high diversification, I'm talking about not only markets, But we're also talking about diversifying across asset class, business plan, hold time, uh, risk profile, uh, diversifying across operator who we're partnering partnering with, our boots on the ground operator. So all those factors allow us to place small bets with a lot of different operators. And so to answer your question more directly, we've acquired uh, assets in the in Houston, Texas, Kansas City, Missouri, uh, Northeast Cleveland, Ohio, um, and uh, Savannah, Georgia. So really the goal isn't necessarily, uh, initially it was focused on the Midwest. What I realized is that a lot of my investors didn't necessarily only want to participate in the Midwest. They wanted, uh, they wanted to be diversified across a lot of different markets. And so that's our focus. We've identified a handful of operators that we're willing to work with at this stage. And that's really what we focus on is their expertise in whatever market they're in. And we have some preference. Generally, we're looking to be um, you know, across the Sun Belt, in the South, Southeast, and for cash flow purposes, select markets in the Midwest. Okay. Let's talk about operators. It, it's um, in, in my experience and, and in my like kind of network of, of people I connect with regularly, 
um, it's it's not always easy to find operating partners that um, you you know you're aligned with, you frankly like, <laughs> you want to do business with. Can you can you share with our listeners a little bit about that process for you? Did you have some bumps along the way, or was it you know did you just get lucky? Yeah, great question. And it's probably the hardest part of investing in real estate syndications is identifying operators that you would want to work with. Uh, because not because there's not a lot of capable operators out there. Um, it just takes time to get to know people. Right. And so uh, before I was involved and partnered uh, on my very first deal, I um, I spent a significant amount of time getting to know a lot of different operators in a lot of different markets. And uh, ultimately, this particular operator that uh, that I partnered with, uh, I had known for 18 months, over a year before we even decided to do a deal together. And a lot of that time was spent on Zoom calls, conference calls, meeting in person, um, and really getting to know each other. And more me getting to know them, understanding their philosophy around real estate, uh, how they think about investing, some of the deals that they had done in the past. And so I, uh, once I decided that I was going to help my investors participate in these type of deals, I set out with some criteria that I was looking for in an operating partner. And uh, just to sort of run down the list, at, at, the, at the very top was simply uh, an operator that was boots on the ground in the market that they were investing in. There's plenty of operators and lead sponsors out there that are very capable of investing outside of their local market. But for me and my first deal that I was going to get involved with, I wanted someone that had specialty in their background, like or in their backyard. I wanted them to be investing and entrenched in their local market. So that was number one for me, an operator in their local market that we're going to be investing in. Number two, they needed to have a track record of success. And by that, I meant at least a thousand units that they had acquired and ideally five assets. So that was another criteria that I set out to find. Number three, I wanted them to be on a growth trajectory. I didn't want someone who was uh, who had been investing for maybe over a decade, had built up a, a, a very significant, robust portfolio, and was just sort of sitting back on their haunches, just enjoying what they had built. My investors want to be able to invest their money. And so I needed to be able to provide them with deal flow. And that meant that I needed to be aligning myself with an operating partner that had deal flow and was hungry for more. And then lastly, it was simply values aligned. I wanted to be working with someone who would treat people the way that I wanted them to be treated, uh, meaning my investors, uh, that they were honest and ethical and that they would do the right thing regardless of the circumstance. And unfortunately, that's what takes the most time is really getting to know people and, uh, and, and so that, that's what we set out to do. And, and that's what we believe we found in the partners that we decided to work with. That, that, that's great. I, I think the, um, the, the, you know, my takeaway here, um, uh, kind of at the highest level is the intention with which you went about, you know, looking for operating partners. You had, you know, we have criteria for properties we look for. And, um, I mean, you just laid out your criteria for operators, um, you know, that you were searching for. And also, I think the other thing that's important is, um, is the time duration, you know, up to 18 months or so, um, that elapsed to make sure that they met your criteria. So, um, that's terrific. All right. So let's move, let's move to, to, uh, the raising of, of the capital. Um, what I've coined on my notes here is, um, your 48 hour raise, just kind of share with us your story there. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, I often refer to it as, you know, raising, uh, over a million dollars in 48 hours without any prior capital raising experience. Right. Uh, the reality is that, uh, I just alluded to this, that even though from the time we sent the deal out to when we had raised actually $1.4 million, was uh, roughly 48 hours. The reality is that I put in a tremendous amount of work the 18 months prior to sending out that email to my investor network, notifying them that the deal was open for reservations. And so again, I had already alluded to this, but just to touch on the points, 
I, I had started to build my philosophy around what I was trying to do. I was communicating this concept to my investor network all along the way. I was having conversation after conversation after conversation with my investors about what we were looking to do. Meanwhile, I'm vetting operators, getting to know operators, getting to know markets, underwriting markets to determine where I wanted to be, who I wanted to be investing with, and bringing my investors along on that journey to a certain degree. And so that's what we set out to do. And that was an 18-month process so that we were ready. And, and, and even going a little bit more granular, once we found the deal, I flew out to the market. I previewed the asset. I toured comps. Um, I met with the team. We underwrote the deal together. We discussed the strategy. And, uh, you know, I was there uh, recording video, sharing that video with my investor network and preparing them for the deal that we were eventually going to release. We even went as far as recording a webinar with my operating partner about them and about the local market that we were investing in so that our investors were not only aware of me, but also the partner that I was going to be working with and the market that we were going to be investing in. So that was probably overkill, um, honestly, but the reality was this was my first uh, syndication deal that I was involved in. I was taking it very seriously. I wanted my investors to feel uh, highly confident in our strategy and what we were doing. And so I did. It was overkill. But by the time we ended up releasing that deal to our investor network, you know, we had, you know, oversubscribed our, our uh, you know, targeted raise within 48 hours. Yeah, you, you know, it's um, in my experience, um, it's the people um, on you know the op the operate the team um, that investors ultimately ask the most question. From my experience, the most questions about yes, they want to go through the assumptions and the returns and the market, etc. But those those you know answering those questions is actually relatively easy. And yeah, you get some pushback of I don't think the exit cap rate is going to be that, and you're like okay. But the most kind of intense questioning. Um, I find has to do with the people. So I think, and I'm glad you brought it up. I think the um, interviewing your operating partner, um, I, I had researched that on you and I thought, wow, that was, that's just spot on a terrific, um, uh, a, ter a terrific way to build confidence and, and kind of peace of mind with your investor group. So let's shift over to like, it, it's a, a period of time and you don't have um, a deal and investment to present to your investors. and. Um, you want to keep them, you know, kind of warm and ready. And you also know that they're probably talking to some other folks that, you know, do something similar to you. Uh, maybe not everyone, but some. What do you do to keep them warm and ready? Well, um, I think the most traditional way to go about that is keeping them up to date with uh, some sore, uh, some form of a newsletter. Um, you know, I've subscribed to, you know, dozens of different operators newsletters and I love getting them. You know, they, they're keeping me abreast of what they're up to, what's going on in the market, what they're seeing. And so I provide that to my investor network. In addition, the vast majority of my investors are Utah based. Okay. And so I'm also providing them with information that's local to our market and uh, is relevant to that small scale multifamily. So I have reason to be reaching out to them and providing them with content and information that is, uh, you know, pertinent to their local market as well. For those that aren't part of my local uh, investor network, and they're more just interested in our passive investing opportunities, then it's generally a, uh, a regular newsletter keeping them informed. But we've had enough deal flow uh, over the last, you know, roughly 18 months where it's more been just sending out opportunities for them to participate in and less about sending out a newsletter. Although we have been, you know, pretty um, conservative as of late as and deal flow has reduced dramatically. So moving forward, there will need to be a more intentional effort made to stay in contact with our investors, provide them with valuable information and stay in touch so that they are ready and, and haven't gone cold when the time comes that we have another opportunity available. Thank you. So kind of related to, um, you know, kind of the state of the market today, inflation, the economy, global stuff, um, 
Are there any new themes that you're hearing from your investors in terms of what they might be concerned about or conversely, what they might view as an opportunity given some of the uncertainty in the market? Is there anything new there versus, say, 12 months ago, or is it pretty much consistent? Uh, well, no, it's dramatically different than it was 12 months ago. Mm -hmm. um, I think as a general overarching rule, investors have become significantly more conservative. They're holding on to more cash, even though they know that that's hurting them. Um, I think that investors played pretty fast and loose uh, you know, in the last few years, and rightfully so. There was a lot of reasons to be trying, uh, you know, deploying their capital and having it work for them. Um, but I also think conversely that uh, their um, hesitancy to be as aggressive is, is uh, you know, well-placed. And I think right. everybody should be a little bit uh, more conservative than we have been in the past, uh, simply because it's a lot harder to make deals pencil. You know, uh, you know when rates jump by two points, um, it changes the whole environment. And so uh, I think that a lot of the deals that have been done in the last 90 days are deals that were really struggling to get across the finish line and to make work. In many of those cases, um, they had a deal that was under contract, rates jumped dramatically, um, and they were having to reconfigure the whole deal and and go back and, and retrade. In the commercial space, in the last uh, probably five to seven years, this concept of retrading, which is just an industry jargon for renegotiating on generally price and terms of a deal after you've got the deal under contract and you've you know been into your due diligence. And retrading was looked upon as taboo. Right. Uh, you can't be doing that. You know, if you retrade, you're going to be, you know, tagged as that guy that retrades <laughs> and you won't have deal flow in the future. Well, I think things are changing and have changed. And so in the last 90 days, I think you've seen a lot of retrading uh, done and rightfully so, right? Market right. circumstances warrant that. So uh, to go back to your initial questions of, you know, what, what are what are investors feeling and thinking today? I think everybody um, to a certain degree is saying, all right, let's wait and see what happens. And at the same time, there's an urgency to place their capital. They know that by having just cash on hand or in the stock market that they're losing on a daily basis. Right. And so the question then becomes, where are you going to place that capital? Well, uh, you know, recession uh, resistant multifamily self storage, mobile home parks, uh, industrial warehouse, those are uh, asset types that historically have been very recession resilient and uh, are places where investors want to put their money. They're just being more careful about the deals that they get involved with. Right. Um, great, great, great answer. So, so my, um, I need to kind of, as we turn the corner here, um, I want to ask you, and this, this has to do with you and your, your business itself. You know, many of our listeners like you, like me are somewhere in their journey of actually creating a business in, uh, in investing in primarily multifamily, but certainly other assets too. If you, if you could predict over the next say 12 months, any challenges or obstacles you think you're going to have to like navigate? Do any, does anything come? Does anything come to mind? Or not necessarily challenges or obstacles. I think there uh, clearly there will be some. Sure. What I'm looking at is opportunity, right? And seeing great opportunity in turmoil. Anytime there's chaos, uncertainty, uh, uh, that creates opportunity. And so the operating partners that that I work with are aggressively looking at deals and mm -hmm. trying to make those deals work. Now, granted, uh, where I see the opportunity taking place is in price adjustments. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've seen it. Um, I, I don't believe in, in the deals that I've reviewed and what I'm seeing happen in my local market. I'm not seeing the price adjustment necessary to counteract the rate hike that the in the in the rate environment that we're currently in, oh, the really? environment that we're currently in. Well, I think simply sellers are still hoping 
that they'll be able to, they, they want what they could have gotten right. six, eight to 12 months ago. And so they're still holding out in their minds. They say, well, maybe I'll hold out for another 90 days. Let's see what happens with the Fed rate. And if that comes back down, if they can get this inflation thing under control, rates come back down, uh, prices will stay consistent and I can get my price. Well, that may be the case. Uh, I believe that we're going to start to see sellers really looking at their situation and saying, yeah, you know what? I could hold out for a better price in the future or the potential of a better price in the future. Um, but I've owned this property for five, 10 years, and I've experienced a tremendous amount of growth. And me taking a little bit of a haircut off of what I could have received if I had sold six months ago, but still getting a great uh, price today makes sense for me. And I'm going to go ahead and take some chips off the table and maybe recapitalize, reposition that equity in one form or another, or just be sitting on more cash. I think you're going to see that. And I think sellers are going to be coming down on their prices. It's, it's going to become necessary because deals just won't pencil. Um, and so I think you're going to see price adjustments taking place. And that's the big opportunity that I see uh, yeah. in the future. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. And and I would add, I would add that, you know, if, if you're able to, you know, if a seller like the seller you've described says, OK, you know, I've got enough profit in here. I'm going to sell it at a market uh, rate and, and a buyer comes in and buys it so that it cash flows um, at, a, you know, an interest rate that's high, relatively high. And in two or three years, then, you know, the interest rates go down, they're able to refinance, um, then they've just, you know, then they, they will have realized a lot of value. So I, I yeah. would agree. I'm in the, it's, there's an opportunity camp, uh, but be smart. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. So, so final, final couple questions. Um, with respect to your just kind of overall motivation, like how, what gets you up in the mo morning? What's your big motivation? And the answer cannot involve real estate. <laughs> well, uh, I alluded to the fact that I had sort of a life event happen, you know, uh, years ago. Um, that was a phone call that I got um, in, in the middle of the night uh, that my dad, who had recently just had uh, heart surgery, uh, valve replacement, which the surgery went fantastic. He came home, he was home, but ended up, uh, we found out later that uh, he had an infection um, and he went septic. And ultimately, my my dad is, is still here with us today, Good. but uh, he he literally died and was revived. Wow. And uh, he was in the ICU for uh, a couple months. Wow. And and so that really caused me to reflect on my situation and realize that I hadn't done nearly enough as it relates to uh, setting my family's future up uh, for for to to have what we needed to have to feel comfortable and confident about my my family's future. And so that's uh that that is what gets me going. That's what keeps me motivated is really my family. Right. Um everything I do really comes down to my wife and and my four little ones. So Right. Uh right. that and that keeps me plenty busy, that's for sure. Well, I mean, I I, I can imagine that event um experience with your dad and family it had to have been very sobering. And uh, obviously, I'm, I'm glad he's OK. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Qu question two, um, you know, in my experience, uh, the life of an entrepreneur, like it comes with some bumps, um, some ups, some downs um, and, and and stress. And that stress can be even you know magnified if you've got a family to provide for, et cetera. What do you do consistent with some consistency that keeps um you know, you from being too stressed, too overwhelmed, so that you can, um, you know, operate effectively in the world. Yeah, that one's easy. Um, about seven, eight years ago, some friends and I opened up uh, a small little CrossFit gym here locally in uh, in Pleasant Grove, Utah. And so every morning, the alarm goes off at 530. I do press that snooze button. Um, and so my wife and I end up getting up around 540 and we make it to the gym by six o'clock every morning together, virtually every morning. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and that's the number one thing, get in, get a good hard sweat, 
uh, going for the day. And honestly, that's uh, incredible. There's been times where I've had heavy, heavy stress on my shoulders. Um, and uh, being able to go in and get a workout, it's amazing what that does. It just recalibrates everything, helps you to think clearly. And so that's the number one thing that we do on a daily basis is uh, get that morning workout in. Excellent. David, uh, thank you for coming on the show. There's so much we, more we could have talked about. Um, if listeners want to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, so um, I'll give them a, a, a free resource. Um, a lot of my investors uh, that I have dialogue with and that I work with uh, and clients that I work with, they've bought real estate in the past uh, five years, 10 years, and they have a tremendous amount of equity built up in those uh, in those properties. And what they often forget about is not just their initial investment, but what is their return on the equity that they have tied up in that property? And many of them will be very surprised to find out that their return on equity is dramatically underperforming compared to what it could be doing for them. And so I have a free resource. If they, if your listeners will go to returnonequityreport.com, that's returnonequityreport.com, they can download our free calculator, pl- uh, punch in their numbers in just a couple minutes, and they'll get a free report showing them what their return on equity is in their existing property. And then, of course, they can reach out to me at canovocapital.com. That's C A N O V O capital.com, canovocapital.com. And that will also be uh, in the show notes. Uh, And for listeners who would like to connect with me or have interest in being on the show, uh, please feel free to shoot me an email, peter at northlightgrowth.com and on LinkedIn at Peter Pomeroy. Thank you all for listening and I wish you a great week. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, Please go to iTunes and leave a rating and written review to help us grow and reach more listeners. Subscribe too, so you can get the latest episodes. Lastly, to stay updated, head on over to verticalstreetventures.com. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, you can schedule a call with our team on the website. Thanks again for joining us. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode.